Today's guest is Lindsay Butterfield. Here's our job talk with a registered professional planner. Welcome to the Job Talk podcast, where we talk with people who love their jobs. Our guests open up about their challenges, surprises, and secrets to success in their industries. Through conversation, we explore their careers, past work experiences, and the education that got them to where they are now. I started this podcast because when I was graduating from high school, I was experiencing some anxiety because I was watching all of my friends. It seemed like they knew what they wanted to do and they were starting down down their path. When I hear of a career like yours and the title is Registered Professional Planner, I always feel that that's like a grown-up job because I don't really know what you do. Can we start by talking about when you were in high school, what kind of a student were you? And then we'll follow your path up to the career that you're in right now. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. High school. I, um, I'll say in high school, I mean, I was a good student. I loved English. That was definitely my favorite class. Um, not so much science and math in particular, especially once I hit math 30, like that was a bit of a disaster. I went from an honor student to like having a tutor and, and barely scraping by. So, um, so I knew that I wanted to do something sort of more in the arts area. Um, and actually in high school, I thought, well, maybe I'm going to go to journalism school because I love reading. I love writing, uh, researching. And then I went to a career fair and learned what journalists do. And I just thought that is not for me at all. Um, and so I was kind of like, well, what do I do next? And uh, I ended up going to the University of Alberta um, and just taking a general arts degree because I really didn't know what it was that I wanted to do. I had a few ideas. Um, and at the time, too, my parents said, well, you can always get a business degree and that'll assure you a job. And so I, I started first year arts uh, coming out of high school, not knowing at all. So I, I think I was a lot like you, Kim. Um, just not exactly sure where my path was going to go, but I knew what I liked and I knew what I didn't like. What courses were you taking for your Bachelor of Arts? Yeah, so my first year I took, you know, all the business prerequisites. Um, I took anthropology. I thought anthropology was going to be something I was going to really get into. Also turned out to not be true. Um, and then I took, you know, an assortment of things like uh, Canadian studies class, a philosophy class, political science. Um, and I had two classes that were sociology and one in the first term and one in the second term. And I fell in love with sociology. Um, those two classes, I was just like, everything makes sense. I'm really engaged. Um, I love the material uh, and it just feels like this natural kind of fit. Um, whereas my macro and microeconomics classes could not have been further from something that I was really interested in. Um, and so it took, me, it took me a little while for that to settle in, but eventually I, I figured out um, I'm gonna have to do a major in sociology because that is really, um, that, that's what floats my boat. But you got through the courses that you weren't really interested in. It's always amazing to me because it seems like such a struggle if you're studying something that you have no interest in. That's true. And and I think, you know, I, I definitely, that that was something I, um, I learned a lot of lessons about being a student. And, and frankly, like uh, school had generally been fairly easy for me. And so university was a big change as well, because all of a sudden I wasn't getting great marks. Um, but I was in the classes I was really interested in. So I, I think like what's true is the things that you love are the things that you're going to focus on. Um, and, and that's still true even in my career today, frankly. Yeah, that's a common theme I'm hearing from doing these interviews is that when the person arrived at university, it becomes a wake up call. So, yeah. you know, it doesn't always come as easy as it maybe it did when you were in high school you took four years to complete your degree or did you take more years to complete the degree? Um, I took a, a, I took five. And the reason being that um, I, I, I did actually change my major. Now that I'm thinking it wasn't until my third year that I changed my major. 
Um, I ended up taking that fifth year because um, I enrolled in a, an international exchange. And so I spent a semester um, working to save money for that international exchange and finished my school in England, actually. Um, so it was a very light year in terms of coursework, but it allowed me to sort of, um, yeah, expand my horizons as a person and do some traveling and that sort of thing. Uh, but I did graduate with that major in sociology and I minored in English. So back to, you know, what I was originally interested in, um, that minor actually allowed me to like read novels and then talk about them, um, which was kind of fun. I feel like I like ripped off the system by just, you know, they're like read books and then talk in class about the books we read and yeah. how we thought about them. It was pretty great. What an excellent experience. Where in England were you? Uh, I went to the University of Lancaster, Lancaster University, uh, lived on campus. Uh, they have a really different system there with uni. Uh, so I was actually in uh, student residences, which is only open to first year and third year students. Uh, second year students have to live off campus um, and they only have three years because they actually specialize um, in school quite young there. So in their you know, equivalent of high school, you have just two or three subjects that you study. Did you know anyone over there or did you just go over by yourself not knowing anyone? Yeah, I just went over there, uh, made friends with uh, my flatmates in the student residence. And uh, so I was an honorary member of the handball team, which is not the same, or netball team, netball, which is kind of like a mix between handball and basketball. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I had actually a really good friend that I met who was also from Canada and another exchange student from Holland. So uh, yeah, it was a really cool experience. Did you use that as a home base and did you travel around yes. to other European countries during that time? Yeah, not so much to other countries, um, a little bit. Like I did go to Holland uh, with to visit the friend that I had made, um, but I traveled all over the UK. I went to like probably at least a dozen of the major cities in um, England. Also went to Scotland several times. Um, Isle of Man took the ferry over there. So yeah, like really made the most of where I was um, rather than flying off to other countries. Um, yeah, so I feel like I had a good lay of the land for, for England. And that was one year, one calendar year? Uh, it was actually one semester for them but it was december through july okay end of december yeah so um you finish that experience you come back to canada i'm assuming and is it more schooling at this point or are you now starting to get into you, your career yeah so um another reason why i took that fifth year actually is because in my fourth year of undergraduate I saw an ad in the Gateway at the university, it's the student paper, and it was for an urban planning program uh, at Dalhousie University. And I was like, what the heck is that? And I happened to be taking a sociology of, of the city uh, class at the time. And I was like, well, I'm really loving this class. I wonder what that is. And so this was, of course, I was thinking about this this morning. I'm like, this is what makes me feel old. It was before <laughs> there was really the internet. Yes. Uh, so I had to actually go to the student resource center and look through course catalogs for different universities to find course descriptions and program descriptions for urban planning, uh, which again, I had never heard of. And as I sat in the, the room reading these descriptions, I realized that is the path for me. That is the career for me. This hits all the things I enjoy doing. Uh, it's creative. It's complex. It's about the places we live. Um, and, and so I started applying, um, did some research and applied to some universities in Canada. So I knew that I needed extra credits. And so I would have a tough time getting in for a September start in a graduate program. And so that's really another factor in my said, okay, I'm going to find some other way to, to pass this year five. Um, and that exchange was really uh, a great way to do that, um, as well as, yeah, again, saving some money, which became very necessary when you're traveling uh, in pounds. We have young listeners that don't understand living in a world without internet access. Yeah. So um, I, rem I recall it very well. Um, I guess let's start off by, can you explain what a registered professional planner um, 
is, and then I'd like to talk to you about your day-to-day. Sure. Yeah, so um, I'm a city planner, the registered professional planner. That is my professional designation. So um, you do have to have credentials to get that designation. So it's like if you're a doctor behind your name, you have MD. Um, That's what the RPP is. Uh, It also comes with member of the Canadian Institute of Planners. So it's RPP, MCIP, lots of letters. It looks really important and intimidating. uh, So that's kind of fun. Um, But yeah, that's what that means. So it is just the professional designation. And the way that you do need to do that in Canada is that you need to have a certain, um, uh, some specific educational credentials and or um, some work experience. Um, And you do have to apply and go through a testing. Um, You have to go through testing. And how, how intense is the testing? Is this... So it's pretty different from when I did it. When I did it, it was uh, fairly laid back. I went into a room and and some existing members interviewed me and asked me some questions, you know, around ethics and professional behavior. Um, Now I know it's quite a lot more intense and and I probably can't speak to the details too well because I don't have to do it. But yeah, um, certainly I know from talking to some of my staff that it's quite involved and, and, uh, feels like quite a stressful event. So I guess like any other professional designation, and, and there's lots of them, uh, it's it's something that's important and can be a little nerve wracking. Lindsay, are there different kinds of city planners? Yes, absolutely. So um, myself, I am uh, primarily focused on policy. So I develop new policies um, that will shape the city for you know generations to come in some cases. Um, I definitely think that a lot of people end up doing development planning. And so, again, that's sort of that fundamental of um, subdividing land and then walking through approvals for buildings to be built, parks to be developed, that sort of thing. Um, I also work right now with uh, quite a number of ecological planners. And so they have specializations in the natural sciences. Um, They work on my parks team and... uh, and have a really good foundation for both land use and also um, natural systems. Um, those are just a few. There's also, there's yeah, there's so many different kinds. A lot of people are really interested in urban design. So that's um, about the places that we go in the public realm. Uh, you might have heard about the warehouse park that's being developed in downtown Edmonton. And there's definitely a range of uh, different planners involved there, but urban design being a key one. Um, I I don't know anything about that initiative. Could you explain that a little bit? Sure. That's a city project. Uh, There are a bunch of surface parking lots in uh, the downtown core, and uh, there will be some apartment buildings built around them, and then the parking lots will actually be turned into a park over the next few years. Um, So that's pretty exciting. That'll be really great to see for our downtown. Why, Why should somebody consider going into a career of being a city planner? Well, just because it's so dynamic and, uh, you know, if you care about people and the places that people live, I think there's nothing you could do that really has more of an impact. And, and that's really what drew me to it is how can I shape the quality of life of the world around me? Um, and so that can be in small ways. It can also be in really big and impactful ways. Okay. Can you take us through a day to day for you and what you're doing in your job? Yeah, well, the fun thing is that my day to day is different every day. Um, And and mine's probably a little bit different too, because I'm a manager now. So I am a director um, at the city of Edmonton. So it's a much more management focused job versus like doing and getting in up to your elbows um, into the the work. Um, But a lot of it, I would say is really just uh, collaborative work. Um, So I work with engineers, I work with folks in economic development, I work with the people who build things as well as plan things to make sure that the things we're planning are actually able to be built. Um, Yeah, we work with all kinds of people. And so I would say one one of the key things about this job is just coordination. So you're constantly coordinating um, and and uh, that can be with clients external to your workplace or with the people that I work with every day. And what do you love about the the position? 
What I love is that it is different every day. Um, I think planning is a really great job if you're someone who's a bit of a generalist because there's such a wide variety of different things you can look at. Um, and that was certainly me. Like I was the kid who in grade two when we had to draw a painting of what we wanted to be when we grew up, I sat there the whole class staring at my blank paper because I just couldn't figure out what that was. I just knew it wasn't a police officer or a bus driver or a teacher or all the other things that the other kids were drawing. And so it just really is uh, something that gets into the design of our cities, um, parks and the environment, um, where buildings go in the design of them, um, how people move around the city. All of these things are really important, um, as well as how we listen to the people who live here and take their input into account as well. So. Um, it really just has such a, there's just such a broad array of things that you can be involved in at any given time. And I think that's the thing that's really exciting about it for me. Do you have projects that you're most proud of? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> probably like dozens. Um, yeah, I think one of the things, so I, I worked for quite a long time in the city of Spruce Grove and and I was very, very proud of rewriting their zoning bylaw, their land use bylaw, um, which is kind of like for planners, it's a bit of a nerdy thing even. Um, <laughs> it's very much about the regulations on a specific lot and talks about what you can build and how you can build it there. And uh, so it's a very technical document, but um, completing that and getting that approved by council, that was one of the highlights of my career for sure. Um, yeah, and, and I've like, there's a lot more. That one's really technical, but um, I'm definitely working on some really interesting stuff right now. One that just is, uh, has become public recently is a national urban park. Um, so that's a, a partnership between the city of Edmonton where I work and Parks Canada. And, and that's like, obviously very, very interesting and exciting. So very early, but that's gonna be a fun one as well. When you're getting an initiative um, approved by council, do you have to go present it as well? Or is this all written document uh, that you have to supply to them? Yeah, so um, when we go to council, we do have a written report. And so that allows them to sort of um, take their time, review the information, um, and then we do present to council. Um, with Edmonton City Council, because they have such a, a large number of things to cover, uh, sometimes you don't end up presenting. So they, they have a selection process for their agendas and some things get approved automatically through Omnibus, but others, uh, others don't. And then you have to um, present, also answer questions. If they aren't quite happy with um, the way that you've put things forward, then you might have to make changes. Um, so they are ultimately the decision maker on many things for sure. So there's a public speaking element to your position yes. for sure. And you're, yeah. you're completely comfortable. What, what skills have you learned that allow you to speak publicly about something that you've created? Do you think? Practice. Like, honestly, um, I had a, I had a boss and he said, you're going to start presenting. And I remember it just being like the most nerve wracking thing in the world. And the more you do it, the easier it is. So um, presenting to council is one aspect, Kim, but there's a lot of other like committee work I do where I need to go and represent, you know, my staff and my planners, um, where we're just one opinion among an array of opinions. And, and so really, um, the art of negotiation is something really important. Um, and, and actually I'm doing some training right now in, in learning more about negotiation and conflict and, uh, that's been extremely useful. Uh, so yeah, those skills are, are really, really key. What are some of the challenges that you experience and stresses in your day-to-day -day work? Well, there are many of those. Uh, I think that one of the biggest challenges with planning is there's no right answer and everyone has an opinion. Um, and so uh, I would say another big piece of the, the work that I do is sorting through all the different ideas and opinions and trying to strike a balance. So, you know, I have guiding documents that I have to look to. Um, for the city of Edmonton, we have a, a piece of policy. It's called the city plan, and that is our guiding light. So the 
policy outlined in there is what I need to follow. But there's a lot of gray area within that. So it's really about navigating those gray areas and understanding how to balance different interests um, to get the outcomes that uh, you want to present or the outcomes that city council has asked for. What advice could you give to somebody that is looking at a city planning position? Well, I don't want to give away my interview secrets and the things <laughs> I look for. So I'll be careful about that one. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, uh, this, this might sound a little bit odd, but for, for young planners that I talk to, I often say, like, go work in a smaller community because you'll actually just get a lot uh, more variety in your experience. Um, when you work in a big company, it doesn't matter if it's a city or if it's, a, you know, I'm not, not picking on a specific, but Stantec, just because their building is next door to ours, not because that's a preference. Yeah. Um, you, you inevitably get um, somewhat siloed and uh, that can be good because you can get very deep expertise. But if you're looking for that broad expertise so that you can really figure out what you like, um, working in a smaller place will give that to you. What makes a successful city planner, do you think? Someone who can navigate the... Uh, those, those various opinions and uh, perspectives. Um, and I think if you're able to balance those and um, a big part of balancing that so that people are satisfied is also educating. So talking about why are things the way that they are and being able to convey uh, so that they understand, like, why is it that my neighbor can plant that tree there? Um, might seem just like not a big deal, but I can tell you that there is a lot of uh, discussion you get to have as a planner about things like that. And, and so it's just about being able to explain when you have rules, why are they there? And, uh, and then also to accept that sometimes we have rules and, and they don't make sense and, and being able to navigate how to adapt those. You get cons constructive criticism directly from the public or is that another department? Do people well, some direct... of it's not very constructive. <laughs> <laughs> but are they, are they reaching directly out to you or do they go through a different avenue? Uh, so it, I suppose it depends if they know who I am and, and we're working actively on something. Yeah, they can reach out directly to me. Um, you know, email addresses are pretty easy to find when they're always in the same format. Um, so yeah, people can reach out directly to me. Uh, sometimes they reach me through, um, a counselor trying to find the right person, uh, to answer a question. It really just depends, but yeah, I'm, I'm accessible. We're not going to put up your contact information right. on this, but are, what are the, some of the misconceptions about the position that you have as a city planner? Hmm. I think a lot of people just don't understand exactly what, when you say planner, it's a very kind of vague word. Um, and so when I say, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a planner, uh, a lot of people think I plan events. Um, I've had a lot of people say, oh, you, you decide where the roads go, um, which... <laughs> <laughs> is interesting. Um, yeah, so I think there's just a lot of misunderstanding of what a city planner actually does. And, and that that's, that makes sense to me, because there are such a wide variety of things that city planners do. But I would say like the foundation of what work we do is really determining um, what can be built where. What surprises have you experienced throughout your career? Do any stand out? I think the surprises are the things that come across my desk that I end up being involved in. Um, and again, that just speaks to the broad nature of the profession. But uh, for example, right now, one of the files I manage is um, the fund for deep trunk sewers. And I thought, well, that's going to be the worst part of my job for sure. And as I learned more about the deep trunk sewer network and how it's constructed and and how do we collect fees for it and that sort of thing, it's actually really interesting. I won't get into it because I don't <laughs> want anyone to log off. Um, but yeah, it, it's really interesting what you find interesting in this job and, and things that you never thought you'd be involved in uh, become quite fascinating. What types of things, initiatives are coming down the pipeline for city planners, do you think? Yeah, I think in terms of um, what are things that we're going to have to think about in the future? Um, the number one is going to be climate change, and there's definitely land impacts as a result of climate change. 
Um, so whether that's flooding um, through our rivers and streams uh, because of high rain events or um, the need to have adequate stormwater protection in neighborhoods, um, whether it's high heat, uh, what that's going to do to our biodiversity, um, those are all things that are going to imp impact the profession. Um, the other thing that um, I'm noticing that's become very important, and rightly so, is, is that uh, we really have a focus on uh, reconciliation uh, with our Indigenous communities, um, with, with the Indigenous communities around us. And so um, I know for myself, I've done a lot of learning and reflection over the last five or so years, especially. Um, and it's been really interesting to, to think about how we can look at uh, use of the land from a different perspective. And, and I just see that becoming more and more important as we go in the future. When you're not working, what do you like to do? What are some of your interests? I like to lie in my hammock and read in my backyard. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got a couple of kids and so I like being able to do things with them around the city and um, and uh, I definitely like to cook. So I'm looking forward to um, being able to do that again. And with that, I think I just want to thank you for, for joining us today. And uh, I, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you about being a city planner. Thanks for having me, Kim. This was great. Thank you for tuning in to the Job Talk podcast. For more information, please visit us at thejobtalk.com.